Good morning. So do you like the... Oh man, I'm too loud. So the round tables are set up again because of the funeral yesterday. So do you like the round tables better than the square ones? Alright, everybody who likes the round ones better raise your hand. Everybody who likes the... Rectangular ones, raise your hand. Everybody who doesn't care, raise your hand. <laughs> the I don't care is when. Followed by the round, followed by the rectangle. So I make no promises. Huh? When I'm over there? I've never been over there with the microphone, though. Over here. Oh, but I was over here. All right, so we want round and we want me somewhere else. The second part I can handle. I can be long ways away. All right, well, maybe next week we'll try round with Mia down at that end and we'll see if the acoustics are better. I don't know why they would be, but unless it's just this curve. We'll let um, one of our resident engineers figure out why the acoustics is better. I like you up there so I can look out the window. That's what I figured. So you got something to do other than listen to me. I, that's, yeah. It's not a bad view. Huh? It's not a bad view. It's not a bad view? Looking at me or out there? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what I thought we'd do today is uh, one more installment of the real story of Christmas, um, picking up with the three kings, since we usually kind of combine that, right? The, the three kings are in our major scenes usually uh, during Christmas. Uh, you've all been lectured on why that's wrong, um, but we'll go through it again today. And then there's some other neat stuff for us to look at. Uh, and figure out. So why don't you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. And let's begin with prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us another year of celebrating the birth of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And another time now to look at the visit of the uh, three of the uh, Magi that came uh, from the East. Uh, we praise you and thank you for uh, the gift of your Son uh, and ask you to be with us today as we um, take apart this story, uh, understand what really happened, and make sure we understand uh, why. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so warm up your voices. Okay, are you ready? Everybody sing with me. Ready? We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we travels afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. I know, oh, oh, star, yeah, yeah, we know, I've skipped that part. Oh, how far the story has strayed. Let's take a look at the real story of the visit of the Magi from Matthew's account. So question one starts with how long and how many. Let's get grounded on the story. It should be by reading again Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assessing and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. <clears throat> then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay. You might remember um, a week ago, last Sunday, uh, our gospel reading began with verse 16. Um, and it was about the um, killing of the innocent children. Um, then this last Friday was the uh, celebration of, of Epiphany. So January 6th. So remember, right? So I always remember this. We moved into our neighborhood. This was our 12th Christmas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our first Christmas on, uh, on uh, December 26th, someone knocked on my door. And uh, she said, um, just want to let you know in this neighborhood, Everybody takes their Christmas stuff down on the 26th. <laughs> and, and we don't even have a homeowners association, so it's not even. Right? So I looked at her and I said, um, um, sorry, but I won't be. And she looked at me and she goes, why not? I said, well, first of all, um, I'm a pastor. And the 12 days of Christmas starts on Christmas. It doesn't end on Christmas. So my lights and everything will be up through the 5th of January, and I'll make sure they're off for January 6th, because that's Epiphany, right? 13th day after Christmas, um, 12 days of Christmas, and then Epiphany, and that's when my lights will come down. She kind of stammered and stomped away. Um, we're friends with them now, but anyway, um, <coughs> now everybody leaves their stuff up. <laughs> so, uh, so when people start, Telling, start uh, acting like Christmas is over the day after Christmas. Uh, you can, you know, be like me, and you can get mad at everybody and remind them that the 12 days of Christmas started on Christmas, not ended on Christmas. But anyway, uh, on Friday then uh, was the day for us to celebrate um, um, the visit of the Magi. Uh, and I'm going to be careful to use Magi all day today, and we're going to talk about why, okay? But... Um, uh, was the day to celebrate the um, visit of the Magi. Um, and then traditionally, this first Sunday after the Epiphany is the baptism of Jesus. And as I mentioned, for those of you in early service, we usually end up celebrating Epiphany on that Sunday. We always skip the baptism of Jesus this year. We're doing the baptism of Jesus, and we skip the Epiphany. Okay. But we're in the Epiphany season now. Um, and so um, how long after Jesus' birth... Did, did, was the visit of the Magi? We don't know. Okay. Um, we know that um, uh, uh, Her uh, what's his name? Herod, right, asked the wise men, look at verse um, 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So we're going to talk about this star, but apparently there's this star that appears. These magi see the star, um, and they head to Jerusalem. Okay? And um, um, Herod wants to know from them when the star appeared. Then we know Herod had all the baby boys, two years old and under, killed in Bethlehem. So we know that the visit of the wise men was somewhere within the first two years of Jesus' life. Guesses vary. Okay? Um, everybody, the theologians, right, almost universally guess that Herod, being the nut job that he was, uh, made, sure, made sure that this new king would be included, and so probably gave a pretty wide 
pet, you know, um, gap, right? So the two years is probably, and I don't mean this as a pun, but overkill, okay, <laughs> right? Luther suggested that it was probably within the first three months, okay? But the reason why Luther suggested in the first three months was the assumption that the star appeared on the day that Jesus was born. And it never says that. Okay? So uh, Luther just makes an assumption that the star appears, they get their act together, and they travel. Um, he makes a lot of um, um, kind of calculations based on where they were probably from. And he reasons that probably a five to six week journey was max. So he puts that all together and he says probably within the first month or first three months. Many others say probably closer to a year, right? Because if, if uh, Herod ascertains that it was about a year ago the star appeared, then let's just double that and go for it. But nobody knows exactly how long. What do we know about when they came? It wasn't Christmas Eve. It wasn't Christmas Eve, right? Or it wasn't Christmas Day, right? The shepherds and the and the and the kings of your nativity scenes were not there at the same time. Okay. Um, usually, Vanji hides ours in our nativity scene, but she's decided this nativity scene that we put out in the narthex is a little too fragile for her to start grabbing the kings and whisking them away to some other location. Okay. Um, but yes, it's, it's typically, it's, it's going to be some time after, okay? And one of the things we know, um, where is it? Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down uh, and worshipped him. Right? So the situation is different than when Jesus was placed into the feeding trough. Of the cat. Could be the same place, like we talked about with how the houses were set up with the stable basically in the bottom floor, middle of the house kind of thing. Could be the same house, right? But now they may be in that guest room up on the roof that we were talking about or however it worked out. Okay? How many of them were there? We don't know. Okay? Um, uh, they, uh, um, why do we say three? Three gifts. Because of the three gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We'll talk more about the gifts. Um, but we don't know how many they were. Um, and I've got a question. Question three, we'll go into more detail about who they were. Okay? So we don't know where, where did they come from? The East. The East. Okay? Um, that's all we know. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to believe uh, that it might have been Persia, that kind of area. Um, there's also a lot of reasons. Let's see, what's the other main place? I've got to find out. Um, Arabia, I think. Yeah. Um, and I'll, we'll get into a little bit of, uh, of why that, uh, why that uh, was a possibility. Okay? Any other things we usually get wrong in the story? Yeah, you can think of it. It seems like uh, a lot of the story is that uh, the star point where Jesus was. Yeah, so we need to figure out this star, and we're going to talk about this star in a minute here in question two, and understand it. Yeah. That was my question too. I always thought that they were following the star, but it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that. Well, it doesn't say they follow the start of Jerusalem. Uh, so let's look at question two, okay? Um, where did the Magi go first? Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Why? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, if there's a king born, then where would you expect the king to be? Right? In Jerusalem, the capital of the country, right? Now, how would they finally find the child Jesus? By talking to Herod and Herod talking to the Jewish. Right, so there's two pieces to them finally finding Jesus. Okay, they see this star in the sky, 
And I'll show you a passage here in a minute that could be the reason why they started following it. But they see this star in the sky, and they say, a king is born. And they head to Jerusalem. Okay? Now, they're not following the star at that point. Right? Because where would the star be located? Over Jesus. Okay? And there's lots of things out there about, what is it, Saturn and Mars or something coming together and all this kind of stuff and could be, right? But when you go on with it, yeah. It's supposed to like Bethlehem. It's like 13 miles from right. Jerusalem. Not that a star wouldn't help. Except, notice what happens. Now, two things happen for them to find the baby Jesus. The first is extremely important. How do they first find out where to go find to see Jesus? Scripture. From Scripture. Okay. Herod gets all his guys together and says, where is the Christ to be born? And they point to the prophecies in the Old Testament, right? Um, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of you, for, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. All right? Um, where is that from? Malachi, partly. It's actually not a quote, direct quote from the Old Testament. The first part of it is from Malachi, and the second part is from. It's actually Micah. I mean, Ma Micah, right? Sorry, you get yeah. Um, Micah, and the second part is from where? Isaiah. Isaiah. Hosea. Hosea. Okay, and actually, neither of them are direct quotes. The, the uh, Matthew has put together, and this is per per perfectly acceptable. He didn't change scripture or anything. Perfect. He brought the two prophecies together. The first, that Bethlehem would be this focus. And the second is that this new ruler will shepherd over his people. Okay, he brought those two prophecies. They brought those, those two prophecies together. Or, or Matthew does to point out how they knew where to go, and so they're told to go where Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem's not a huge place, except right. We don't know how long this is afterwards, and we don't know how long people stayed in Bethlehem after this mass of people came in. But even let's assume it's quite a while after and most of the folks have gone home and it's just the Bethlehem people plus a few extras like Mary. Notice who's never mentioned here. Joseph. But he's mentioned later anyway, so we know he's not dead yet. Um, Mary, Joseph, Jesus are, are there. How are they going to find the baby Jesus? Doesn't say go find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. They just say go to Bethlehem. So how are they going to find him? Okay. Yeah. They. I mean, God doesn't leave it, right? God's already intervened once with His Word, and now suddenly, what appears again? The star. And that star directs them to the exact location of where Jesus is. So you can make, all, my opinion, you can make all these conjectures about planets coming together and this special star in the sky when Jesus was born and all that kind of stuff. But what happens now is not anything normal. The star appears, and it can't just be this star way. I mean, how, how do you, like you said... It's only 13 miles, and you're following. This star had to be something that pointed exactly to the place Jesus was. Right? Look what it says. After listening to verse 9, listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So God has intervened here. To reveal to these magi where they can find Jesus. Now the question that's often asked is, what's this whole deal about these guys looking up in the sky, seeing this star and saying, oh, a king is born, let's go to Jerusalem. Okay. Well, there's a couple of pieces to that. There are lots of accounts in ancient historical documents about uh, people mentioning stars that marked 
a, a, a historic occasion, okay? Whether those are imagined or true or whatever, right? And it's not unusual to find writings, I shouldn't say it's not unusual, there are writings in which people have said, when such and such a king was born, something in the sky happened. So watching the stars for signs of things happening was not completely out of abnormal, okay? But why Jerusalem? Why did they see that star and automatically think, oh, a king is born to the people in Israel, let's go to, or in Judah, let's go to Jerusalem? Nobody knows for sure, okay? But there is a passage in Scripture and especially the people that point to the possibility of Persia being that place where they came from. The reason why they say that is because there was a significant Jewish population left there after the Babylonian captivity. And so there was a lot of teaching going on about what's in the Old Testament and what the signs were of the Messiah and all that kind of stuff. So potentially these Magi had heard these things. And so what's this star thing? So open up to Numbers chapter 24. We don't know for sure. There's nothing in there that says that these magi were referring to this uh, prophecy or what. But in, in um, 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 uh, Numbers chapter 4, which is this whole thing about Balaam, um, um, in his or final oracle, Balaam prophesies in this way. Verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So it is conjectured, that's the best we can say. It is guessed that if there's a passage in Scripture that these magi were somehow aware of, and this star appears that they um, knew this prophecy of a, of a star coming out of Jacob and therefore headed to Judah. And if you're going to go find a king, go to Jerusalem. Okay. Questions? Thoughts? Um, so the question about what this star, what this original star was, and even what the second appearing of the star is in it, and Matthew makes seems to make it clear that it's the same star, right? The second appearing of the same star. Um, you'll read a lot of stuff about trying to make this a very natural something. In fact, wasn't it just, I keep looking at Tom because I know he's interested in this stuff too, but I think it was just recently that one of the things that they assumed was the natural occurring of a certain combination of planets or whatever just happened not too long ago. Again, like last month. Um, somebody can look it up. If you look up Star of Bethlehem appearing on your Google, you'll probably find out what date it was. Okay. Um, but uh, many others will say there's no way it was just something natural. This is something supernatural, lack of better put it, something miraculous, because it led the Magi to the Savior. Okay? Alright, question three. <clears throat> it's probably best to call the visitors Magi rather than kings or even wise men. Now notice in the ESV translation that we read this morning, what does it call them? Wise men. Um, so why? Um, and uh, um, um, for help, um, we're at, I pointed us to Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. <clears throat> see, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel, what, two? So I'll read this. Um, and this is just an example. There's 
the, the word that's used in the New Testament, um, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, correlates best to this word that's used in the Old Testament, and it's used um, um, uh, several times in the book of Daniel. Okay? <clears throat> in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and <clears throat> his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. Now that's the definition of what would equate to magi in the New Testament. Okay? Commanded the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we'll show you the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, then there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know, and you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. And again, wise men is the English translation of the word, not really what it's intended to mean. Because we hear wise men, and what do we hear? Smart guys. That's not what this is intending to say. Okay? Um, so the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. And then the story goes on. God reveals the dream to Daniel and the interpretation. Okay. Now, why do we go all the way back there? Okay. First of all, if you're a first century Jew, and Matthew has been written for you, I mean, that's why Matthew was written. The audience is the first century Jewish population. That's why Matthew is filled with all of these prophecies about what the Old Testament said the Messiah would be, and he puts them together with Jesus. He is trying to show the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah. So if you're a first century Jew, and the Bible says the Magi came to visit Jesus, who are they thinking of? They're thinking of these kinds of people. Magicians. Sorcerers. Okay. Um, black arts. Quite frankly. Yeah. Magi is short for magician. Oh, I have no idea. It might, maybe there's a correlation from it to our word magician. Um, but these, these are, they're thinking these foreigners who are practicers of the black arts for lack of a better way to put it. Um, Je Jeff Gibbs, Professor, uh, Reverend Dr. Jeff Gibbs from um, um, the seminary, and I don't remember which one he's at now, it seems to me he moved. But anyway, um, in his commentary, he, he spends quite a bit of time focusing on the fact that they would have not heard kings by any stretch of the imagination, and the way we understand wise men, right, um, we three scientists from Shell come, you know, kind of thing. No. Okay, they're thinking bad people. Okay. 
very much not the kind of people that would come to find Jesus. Okay? Um, good. Questions about that? I have a question. Yeah. Because clear back in Genesis, when yeah. God creates the heaven and the earth, mm -hmm. and he talks about the stars, and he says they will be used for signs and symbols. And so, wonders, yeah. Uh, yeah, so if he made it to show signs and symbols then, I know man fell and we were corrupted. Yeah. But obviously, he didn't say that with no reason. No, I agree. Agree. That's why I mean. There's lots of ancient documents that talk about signs in the heavens that they attribute to the coming of so and so or this event happening or whatever. Again, whether they're real or whether people are just putting things together on our own because we have corrupted everything. Right. So. Um, yeah, it's not unusual that, I mean, there's lots of things in the Old Testament that would say, okay, we're not surprised that there was something that happened in the heavens, in the sky, when Jesus was born. But why would they see it and go to, right, um, they, the, the numbers one is the closest. Well, it just seems one more demonstration that Jesus came also from Gentiles. Well, ultimately, that's, I mean, when we celebrate the Epiphany, Right? What's the main part of our the celebration? Jesus, Jesus came for us too, right? Because these are not, but it's even more than just they're not Jewish, and we'll kind of get to that uh, at the end. Okay. Good. All right. Question four. We may get done early today. It means I could get another nap in before church. <laughs> Much has been made of the gifts the Magi brought to Jesus. How should we understand the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Okay. Now, this, this highlighting of the, um, the three gifts is a lot of what the song, We Three Kings of Orient, are, is built around, right? Three gifts, costly gifts. They must have been wealthy people. Therefore, they're kings. Orient, they came from the east, so that much we know for sure, but we don't know from where, right? And then in history, the kings have names now, right? Uh, Balthazar, um, anyway, there's, there's, yeah, they've got names now and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, they're always on camels. Good possibility, but does it say that anywhere? No. Okay. So we don't know exactly where they're from. Um, we do say east. Let's look at a passage, and, and Luther spent quite a bit of time unpacking this passage and coming up with some of the stuff uh, he came up with. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. Starting at verse 6. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east, and of fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots, etc. So when, again, a first century Jew would have heard the east, would they, Luther spends a lot of time with the, this passage saying, the East connotated bad things. Okay? Fortune tellers like the Philistines um, and lots of wealth. Okay? So when the first century Jewish people are hearing that the Magi came from the East, it's more bad, bad stuff. Now Luther spends a lot of time in his, um, in his sermon on the visit of the Magi, which if you read it, you'll, it'll sound more like a Bible study than a sermon to you. But he spends a lot of time in his sermon explaining that he was absolutely convinced 
that, uh, let's see if I've left something out in Isaiah chapter 2, <coughs> that they came from um, Arabia. Or what would have been known in the Old Testament as Sheba. Okay. And the reason for that is because of the gifts that they brought. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you've heard all of those things that says, you know, they brought gold because Jesus is a king. They brought frankincense because, and I don't remember what that one is, and myrrh was a burial spice, so the kings are prophesying Jesus' death and all that kind of stuff. It's all fine and dandy, but the Bible doesn't say any of that stuff anywhere. Okay? Gold, Frank, the, the, the tradition, uh, think of the Queen of Sheba giving tribute to Solomon. What did she bring? She brought all the wealth of Sheba. And so the tradition was when diplomats from one kingdom uh, went to show honor to another, to another king, what would be sent with them are the things that point to the riches of that kingdom. Okay, so what kinds of things are they mining out of the ground? What kinds of things are there that kingdom's wealth? Okay, and there's documentation that would say that gold, frankincense, and myrrh were prized wealth objects of Arabia, that area, or Sheba. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't Persia like a lot of people claim, but Luther was absolutely convinced that these magi came from Arabia, which gives us a little bit different thought process, a little bit different picture of it than I think when we think of, you know, from Persia, okay? Different people group, obviously, closely related, but, but, but different, okay? And, and he's, he and Dr. Gibbs spent a lot of time making sure we understand that we probably need to see them as not three individual gifts and spend a lot of time trying to make connections of the gift to the recipient, but understand them simply as a gift. This is the gift from these foreigners to this new king. Okay. And, and Luther and Dr. Gibbs spend quite a bit of time helping us understand that a big reason for that is none of the words in the New Testament suggest that for sure that the Magi understood who Jesus was other than a new king. When it says they fell down and worshipped him, those words are no different than they would have done to Herod or any other king. Okay, we hear the word worship, and what do we automatically think of? <coughs> Faith. Okay. Um, yesterday, last night, um, who played who in football? Um, I watched the game. Um, ja Jacksonville played the Titans. Okay? And I don't know if any of you saw, but the, every single member of both teams knelt at the 50-yard line, around the 50-yard marker, before the game to have a prayer for DeMar uh, Hamlin. Now, you cannot tell me that all 80 of those players plus coaches all are Christians. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not statistically possible, <laughs> okay? But they all pray, right? And what are, what are some Christians in the, world, in the United States looking at that and saying? God answers prayers. Yeah, well, God answers prayers. He does. And there were Christians praying. But here, they're looking at it and saying, well, they all prayed. They must all be Christians. Well, no. First of all, people pray to whatever God they believe. So we don't know who all of them were praying to. And second of all, this whole phenomenon, I don't know if you've noticed, right? Everybody's praying for DeMar Hamlin. Whether they believe in God or not. Whether they believe in any God or not. 
Atheists are praying for DeMar Hamlin. Why? Because psychologists have proven that when somebody knows people are praying for them, it helps them. Gives them emotional boost. Now we know something else is going on, right, as we pray to God for people, but, right? Um, and so, but nobody cares whether you believe in God. Just start praying. Okay? Um, so the Magi kneel down and worship, or it says falls down, fall down and worship. What's the words they show? Um, I'm in Daniel still. I wonder I can't find it. Specifically, Matthew says, when they saw the star, they were just you know, doing, going into the house, they saw a child with Mary as mother, and they fell down and worshipped. That is not trying to tell us that they had faith to believe that Jesus was the Son of God sent to die for their sins. Okay? Now, might they have? Don't know. Okay? We don't know. Yeah, I mean, they got to the right place. They found the right one. Mary didn't seem to be surprised that they were there bringing Jesus gifts, right? Um, by the way, um, and, and Luther spends a lot of time with this. What was the, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the Magi representing um, non-Jews coming to Jesus. But then we started thinking about the fact they maybe didn't even believe that Jesus was who he says he was. Um, and so they're not necessarily in heaven waiting for us to get there to tell us all about it, right? Um, Luther actually spends a lot of time um, um, making sure we understand that the visit of the Magi was for a very different reason. And the focus is not the Magi, but the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Not trying to say gold is because Jesus is a king and frankincense and this and myrrh because he's going to die. But what did the gold, frankincense, and myrrh do? Allowed them to escape Egypt. Yeah, paid for their trip to Egypt. Okay? I mean, Joseph is going to be a Jewish carpenter in Egypt for some period of time. They better have their own wealth because he's going to have a hard time getting things, getting the business going in Egypt. Even amongst the Jewish people there. Okay? So the Magi are funding the trip to Egypt. Yeah. So these magi are not coming just just magi it, it, they've got well this is all, probably a caravan all of, their, all of their servants and animals and food and you know well they had to, they had to have enough that they could take right. care of themselves on the journey right right and, uh, which according to Luther I read would we'd expect probably was about a three week journey and okay. they come to this little tiny town, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm just picturing everybody just miles over. What in the world's going on? And they come to this house. Well, we've seen the houses in Bethlehem of, of what they were. Tiny, tiny little houses where many right. people live together, and here come... All of these we don't know how big the caravan was. We don't know how many people there were. We don't know how many magi there were. We don't know how many people traveled with them. Um, we, um, we don't know what they traveled on, right? If they're from Arabia, they probably weren't camels. They probably were horses, but it doesn't matter, okay? Um, so yeah, it's a, it, this is going to be a strange thing, right? And now it's not only a group of folks up from up north in in Nazareth coming down to, you know, like they like it happened uh, for the census, but now it's these obviously foreigners come. They don't even speak our language, <laughs> but they're coming um, to find this child. Somebody, yeah. yeah they have the tents or something like that? I, my, I mean, they had to have had tents and all that kind of stuff to stay in on the way. I mean, there wasn't Holiday Inn, right, or Hampton Inn, depending upon which, you know, um, you, you favor, right? Um, there was no free breakfast before you left in the morning. So you, you, they had to provide for themselves all the way here, right? Um, so they didn't see the star, 
and get up the next morning and head out. This was a significant truth that they were making. Okay? Did they know where they were going? Yeah, they're going to Jerusalem. We can get to Jerusalem. Right? They didn't know anything else. Right? Um, they're just headed to Jerusalem to find this new king. So yeah, they would. We don't know how big the caravan was. We don't know how many there were. Uh, we don't know how many magi there were. We don't know how many besides the magi there were. Um, they could have had a herd of goats or sheep or something that they're bringing with them for food. Who knows? I don't know how all that worked back then. I'm sure there's ancient writings that talk about long distance travel back at that time, but um, I don't know. The people. Uh just the people in Bethlehem seeing this, witnessing this, going into the house. Well, there's well, something. There's something here. Well, and and Joseph and Mary are all of a sudden filthy rich. <laughs> I mean, if, if there's anything that's going to astound the other people in town, it's not only that these guys came. And I'm assuming they're guys, but they're, who knows, right? These men and women came from the east, but they made, they left Mary and Joseph and Jesus filthy rich. That probably woke everybody up. I mean, how many relatives do they have now? Right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like winning the lottery. All of Bethlehem is related to them at this moment. Well, they are. Okay, and remember, after the visit, Herod decides to kill all the babies in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. He's not going to wait long. Why? Because he knows Jesus is there now. And so I'm going to do it quick. Which means the dream comes to Joseph to take the baby and his mother and get out of here and go to Egypt. And he does, he's told to go now. There's no preparing anything. So all he can do is gather up the little bit of things he has and gold, frankincense, and myrrh, very valuable things, and get out of town. He doesn't have time to pack the camel or donkey or whatever, right? And, and make sure he's got enough stuff for a long trip to Egypt. So he's getting out now. They had time. They saw the star. They knew where to go. Let's get our stuff together and go. Okay? Good. Question five. So then how would first century Jewish readers, the intended, intended audience of Matthew's gospel account, have understood the place of the Magi and the story of God's planned salvation for all people? There's no doubt like when we celebrate Epiphany and we say Jesus came for non-Jews also, Gentiles also, that is definitely part of the story, right? That's not, we're not wrong when we celebrate that. But it was much, much more than that when a first century Jew read this account, okay? Because when we say Jesus came for those, for other, you know, Gentiles, for, right? We can easily say, for those who believe. We can easily say, for those who are of the right standing, the right whatever, right? We can put all kinds of connotations on it. But who are the first two groups of people that are introduced to Jesus? A bunch of shepherds out in the fields... Right, which there's all kinds of stuff being written now that shepherds weren't as bad as everybody said they were and all that, right? But still, a bunch of stinky guys out in the fields and sorcerers and magicians from over there in the east where everything is bad. In other words, yes, Jesus came for Gentiles. Jesus came for the most unlikely of all people on earth. And that always reminds me of the passage uh, that um, Paul wrote to Timothy, right? 
It's a trustworthy saying that everybody should take, right? Jesus came to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. And I always laugh and I say, we're not supposed to read that and say, yeah, we know, he was pretty bad. <laughs> He's saying that's how we should see ourselves. Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And, and this account of the Magi, so we've got the shepherds and the Magi, and as far as first century Jewish readers would have come, they could not think of more inappropriate people to come see Jesus. And yet they're welcomed. Questions? Comments? Nope. All right. I've got nothing else. So we get done early today? Next week. So I decided we had so much fun with Ruth. Let's do the other book named after a woman. So we're going to do Esther next. It's a little longer. It's ten chapters, I believe. Esther does. And so as always, I would encourage you this week to read the whole book of Esther. Because we'll do it a chapter at a time. And instead of just breaking it up so that you can see the whole forest between, before we dive into the trees... Read the book of Esther this week. It's ten chapters long, I think. It's not going to take you forever. And I want you to make note of one thing in the book of Esther. God is never mentioned. And then we'll have our work cut out for us from there. <laughs> okay? Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Not, is that what we get? Yeah. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And tomorrow night I will be wrapped up in my Michigan blanket, Dreaming of what might have been. <laughs> oh yeah, we have to put the tables and chairs away, please. The rack for the tables is in the closet, this door over here. <laughs>